ago, I had no clue what a geoid was. Um, <laughs> I come from computer science, computer graphics, and worked more or less uh, on these abstract problems that don't really need a problem. You know, you sort of look for the problem <coughs> afterwards, um, and after you create a solution. And in this case, I had the problem I was tackling. I have many, many points, like say a billion. They're on disk, I can't fit them in memory. And I want to triangulate them and store them back on disk. And I want to use the Delaunay triangulation, which is a well-known triangulation. So all I really was interested in terms of LIDAR was lots of points. So that's why I found LIDAR, because there are lots of points in the 2D plane, sort of 2.5D points. So what I did, I added some finalization tags which gave me the guarantees that triangles were Delaunay. And uh, because usually those points don't have these tags, I created them on the fly. You can then output it directly. And then I realized that this is actually very useful for the people working with LIDAR because these pins can be rasterized into raster DEMs. And that's a product that's very popular with uh, folks um, working with GIS systems. So, you know, I wrote a second paper, and that sort of catapulted me suddenly into the, this community. And it was a great community because people wrote beautifully nice reviews uh, <laughs> compared to this computer science, you know, people that are really like, well, this is just like a small incremental step of a previous work. <clears throat> so, when I started out looking for these billion points, um, people gave me the first half billion in ASCII. It was a one 10 gigabyte GZ ASCII file. Very nasty to work with because it takes very long to parse and uh, you can't see in the file. Uh, just computing the bounding box takes, uh, because there is no bounding box uh, in, the, in, the, in the header. Um, there is no header. Uh, so it's a really poor format. Fortunately, LIDAR became big quickly and some folks at the ASDRS had the foresight to very quickly develop a standard and then just go around to the industry and tell, you need to implement this. And as soon as enough people had implemented this binary standard, it, without there being a real standardization process, it sort of became a de facto industry standard for exchanging a, a LIDAR file. And that's the LAS format. So after the first half billion points was in ASCII, um, I got my next billions uh, in the LAS format. Now the problem is, I didn't know what to do with these files because I, I was a software, um, I, you know, there wasn't an obvious way of loading those because they were binary. And there wasn't a published API, there was just a published specification which you sort of find through this page. So I, I downloaded the specification, which, you know, you, it's very simple. It's just a header, and then it's a bunch of point records. So I just, you know, I'm a computer scientist. I mean, that's easy. So I sat down, I wrote a little API that can read these things and write these things. And, you know, what's here edit? You write a small, a few tools, like, Let's quickly look what's in the file, last info. Let's quickly have a look at it. I used my fourth year um, programming assignment from an OGL course uh, that's now called Last View. It's a terrible uh, interactive viewer, but it works uh, still. Um, you know, some tools to convert back and forth between text and ASCII, uh, between uh, ASCII and the LES format. And I also wrote LAS zip. I'll talk about this a little later. So the way last tool started was me one day deciding, oh, this is kind of a useful set of tools, and you know, there's nothing else like this, so why don't I put it on my web page? So I zipped up the folder, which was called last tools, and put it on my web page. And people found it quickly and sent me bug reports and feature requests. And that was kind of fun. I never really wrote in any code that anybody else would use. Um, so, you know, I maintained it. Uh, wrote a little bit more. 
lid lass. You may have heard of lid lass and last lid. That's my lid lass is Howard Butler's. So lid lass got forked off last tools in November or December 2007 because he liked what I had done and he wanted to make a proper open source project, you know, with source control and proper licensing and make files and all the stuff that the real software engineers do, not the scientists like me that always start with a main.c file. Um, and then last tools development sort of slowed down because I took a job. Um, then eventually I didn't have a job anymore because I got into a little uh, argument with uh, my um, employer uh, about the use of LIDAR, you know, I had some more green ideas and when, you, when you're when you in an argument with a nuclear weapons lab, <laughs> there can be some fallout. <laughs> so the fallout was that I was back in Germany and working last house now full time. So I spent one and a half years making last tools from an academic product into more of an industry strength set of tools that you can actually run in production. I added GUIs because people sometimes said, well, I, I start your tools and a black box pops up and disappears instantly again. What am I doing wrong? And I realized, okay, not many people use a command line on Windows. And this is why I have it sort of as an entrance point to LAS tools. The big a uh, big win was really the ArcGIS toolbox. Uh, since I have that, I, I have a whole new set of users that's opened up because uh, Esri um, with ArcGIS 10.1 has native LAS support. So they go around teaching people, you need to use LIDAR, which is beautiful for people like me and probably all of us because they're doing a lot of ad advertisement for more LIDAR usage. Um, but the ArcGIS toolbox I have actually already works with 9.3 and 10.0. Um, I also started to actively create a user group uh, or, or community. I created the last tools user group. I think that was April 2010. That's that 2011. That's now already. I invited all of you to that list <laughs> this morning. Um, um, I'm on the social media and I joined the AES PRS working group that defines the format because you know, I, I'm quite vested into that format now after having spent so many years on that. And here just some you know, interesting facts. Uh, that's where last was you know, <coughs> doing its thing, it was on my web page, not much happened. Um, and then when I started to actively push last tools to become a, a product and then suddenly you see my the, the announcement on the list sort of were these peaks in, uh, in downloads. These are downloads per week at unique IP addresses. Um, and uh, I found it very interesting to see that there's this regular pattern of people <laughs> not wanting to download LAS tools. <laughs> and I'm, I don't know, I'm, 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 until I looked at the dates and I realized, oh, they're just celebrating Christmas. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> so, let's have a look at LAS tools. When you download what I showed you from the page earlier, uh, from, the, from the link on the first slide, you get, uh, and you just start last tool, which is sort of the master uh, GUI for all LAS tools except one or two. Um, you you get something like this. You can browse. There's some sample data in the data folder, and the simplest thing you can do you go to LAS view. Uh, you can see how many points you actually want to store in memory. So you just sample these. And the interesting thing about my GUI is it's a, it's a subversive way to teach you the command line. Uh, it's, so whatever. You can't read that very well either. Every time you run a tool with the GUI, it will basically indoctrinate you. And it tells you what the command line would be if you would start it with the command line. So you can also then edit here once you 
And as you learn how your button settings translate into command lines. So the, in, initially, the GUI is great, but as you get more advanced, you may want to think directly, either edit it here or run it from the command line. So you can say start, and here you go, that's uh, part of the University of Flinders. And it was classified um, with last tools, so you can say render only ground, or you can just use a hotkey G, and then you can say triangulate, or you can just use a hotkey T. Uh, with a minus, you make the points go away. <coughs> Plus, there's the points again, and you can then say show me all objects which are the buildings and the trees on top of that. So this is just a little way to quickly inspect your data. Um, oh. Every tool has a readme, which can uh, be accessed through here. Now the readme is targeted to the command line users. So I won't talk about button settings here, uh, but that means all that's written in the readme, you can just uh, type in the command line to edit in case there is no button for it. And now one thing a lot of people I noticed don't realize, every tool has its own GUI. So you don't, maybe some people haven't realized that then. So you can run last tool, you get this big GUI with all the tools on the right side. But because there's limited space, these tools don't show all their options. So if you run the tool directly, like I can, can do for example, Let's find a different tool. You can even run because it is essentially the command line. You can you, know, you can run a different tool here, and uh, you run last grid now. So this is you know this is now the tool I uh, was running with the option. Minus GUI and it is that's only last grid. And there's many more options now on the right side. So keep that in mind um, when you when you think, oh, you know, there's hardly anything uh, that I can do um, in the last tool GUI. Try the individual GUI. Those are also the ones I'm more I'm more likely to update. And you also see the option for running a multiple course which is not exposed in the last tool. So that's just a quick intro. We gonna have, we will have more uh, hands-on demos later. And here you see the ArcGIS toolbox. Basically all the tools are listed here. Some tools are listed multiple times, like last to last, which I sort of think of as the Swiss army knife of uh, LIDAR or last tools, it, you can do filter, project, or transform. Uh, because these boxes are kind of clunky, the arches, uh, toolbox boxes, uh, you, you can't have all the options in them. Uh, so that's why I, 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 I um, spread the functionality over uh, several tools, <coughs> toolboxes. Now what's a licensing model? Well, there's a license file called license.txt that nobody reads. Um, <laughs> there's a big open source part, and that is LGPL licensed. Um, that is a compressor and last lib. So last zip is a compressor. Last lib is my version of all the core functionality, and it, it includes last zip. Like, there's no difference between reading a last file and a last file in last tools because it's one code pass. And the core tools, essentially those tools, on the day that last tools split into last tools and lib last, those are also LGPL licensed. I don't know if you know what LGPL means, but you can read up on that. Now there's a closed source part where you don't get the sources. But for you guys, most of you are probably uh, um, academics. You can use those tools you know, for free. Unfortunately, you don't get the source code. 
Uh, I, in the old days, I gave away the source code as well, but I realized that I could make a living uh, of consulting and uh, this, so eventually I closed it and now it's a little easier. Um, so it's free for personal use, you know, if you want to create uh, orienteering maps uh, in your favorite forests, um, create solar cadastres for your local neighborhoods, whatever, you know. Um, if you want to use it for production, they are not free, even below the limit. So there. What I had to do now, unfortunately, at first I just said, well, you can't use it commercially, but people use it commercially anyway. So then I had to put in some point limits. And so you hit those at 2 million to 10 million points, you will hit some limit and it will tell you while you hit the limit of the unrestricted version. Now there is a full academic license, which is cheap. There is a full commercial license, which is not as cheap. And then there is, you know, defense and military licenses, which are expensive. Uh, that's my own moral code. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, and there's a company now. So Rapid Lasso was just founded this month. Uh, that is now the company um, supposed to mean Rapid Laser Software. Uh, it is uh, incubated by uh, the European Space Agency at a remote uh, at the German Aerospace Center next in Munich. Um, yeah. Okay. Now on to some more interesting stuff. Compression. Um, these points are big. Oh, these files are big, you all know. And uh, because I had been working in mesh compression many years, mesh compression is geometry compression. You have triangles, you have points, and you try to make them as small as possible. But there isn't really somewhere out there a mesh repository with huge numbers of meshes that everybody wants. And therefore, all the demand for content, mesh content, apart from games where the meshes are highly optimized and small, is not really there. So when you when you publish mesh compression, everybody said, oh, nice method, but nobody will <coughs> is using it. With uh, LIDAR, that was different because there was some the FTP servers full of uh, LAS files, and people wanted to download them. And if you gave them a method where you can download them 10 times faster, they were actually willing to uh, to consider the compression scheme. So I was really happy because compression was something I was good at. You know, I was really good at compressing my sleeping bag whenever I went hiking. And I was also good at compressing geometry. So I started to, to compress these uh, last files. Um, generic compressors don't work too well. I mean, they work, but they only give you 50 to 30 percent reduction. Uh, percent reduction. Um, there's a commercial solution from Lizardtech, which is very expensive. Uh, they didn't really have a good entry into the market there. There was no compression, and then you charge 3000 when you enter the market. That doesn't work too well. So I entered the market with a slightly different pricing model. <laughs> <laughs> At first, I thought I'd give everybody 10 bucks when they use it, but three, three also worked. Um, yeah, it's completely lossless compressed LAS. With the last tools, there's no difference between an LAZ and an LAS file. They're treated as equal. Um, it's tested. Uh, LASIT was sponsored by the Army Corps of Engineers because they did not want Lizard Tech to take over the LiDAR world like they had done with satellite imagery so that every federal agency then would have for years to come pay royalty with all the time. So. Um, Talk about Lux in a minute. Um, it was winning some award, but the best part is, and that's why it now seems to have um, made the breakthrough in terms of uh, being uh, an accepted standard. It's free. There's a YouTube video on LAS zip. Uh, so if you go on YouTube, you type in LAS zip. Uh, you see me in Salzburg last year, end of November, talking for half an hour. There's a little bit more detail. I give you a little bit of that here. Let's look at some typical LiDAR data set. 
This is uh, LIDAR data in Minnesota. You can download almost all of Minnesota. It's on the FTP server. It's free, open, so open data, wonderful. And when I noticed that I have a lot of LAS data online, I contacted the guy in charge. His name is Tim Lersch. <coughs> I said, you know, that's a lot of data on your FTP service. You want to give LastSib a try? And he tried it out and said, wow, compresses really nicely. It compresses really nicely when, when it's in flight line order, like you see here. Um, so here's a comparison, I think, on 12 of these tiles on an area where without too much forest that compresses better. Uh, and here you see the original size, 1.5 gigabytes. That turned into this is a very this is a good case you know it turns into less than ten percent of the original and uh, the other one is Lizard Tech uh, Lizard Tech struggles really with the GPS times because I don't have a good scheme for that but the the big advantage of LastZip over Lizard Tech is it's much faster on encoding and also significantly faster on decoding and uh, oh yeah then. Uh, Tim decided to offer LAS and LATS side by side on the FTP servers because LATS didn't really add much to the total data. And one day he just deleted all the LES uh, folders and now you can only get it in LES uh, because it's just to, for hosting and backup purposes uh, if you have terabytes of data. It actually translates into significant money savings. More and more software support is being added. Uh, the Fugro wheel wanted to add it, but you know, it got pushed back another quarter or two. Uh, they haven't had enough customers demand it, maybe. But uh, maybe, if, uh, I just, uh, at Silly Laser, I talked with the creator of Fusion, and it's very likely it's going to have Elliot Z support as well. And you can download it from Op Topography for quite a long time already. You just just click here, download in an LAZ format. Uh, behind the scenes is actually last tools that work whenever you download the last tool, the, any kind of LIDAR from Open Topography. They have it stored in a file structure, and when you mark a rectangle in this kind of, uh, this is Lake Tahoe area, what happens then, uh, last to last goes to work behind the scene, and you use spatial indexing, which I'll talk about next to clip out that region, and depending if you want LAS or LATS, it will then uh, create uh, the uh, output file and send you the link. Here, is, as I said, this is Minnesota DNR. They have all these counties. Each one is a county. So I picked Martin County. Um, they, uh, uh, and, and that's how every structure, and there used to be a folder called LAS, and you just deleted those to free up some of the space. And a big push in Europe for LAZ was the National um, Land Survey of Finland uh, had this very proactive, progressive way of dealing with open data. They just said, we're going to unleash all our geospatial data, including the LIDAR. So they had 5.3 terabytes of LIDAR. And they decided to use LAZ to host it because it makes it much more accessible. So if you want to get Helsinki or you know, your favorite fjords in, uh, in Finland, uh, you can just go on uh, the web page. It's, it's linked on lastzip.org. I'll, li I'll link all the pages that provide native LATS files that I'm aware of on lastzip.org. And here's just some, some quote um, from people using LATS. Oh, and yes, the awarded ones. <clears throat> Spatial indexing. Um, you know, since I have, since I was already uh, um, um, coming up with new uh, acronyms, uh, LAZ, you know, the next LAX seemed a natural next candidate. So, what is LAX? It's sort of X for index. Um, I'll give you a live demo because it's a lot easier to explain than this static image. So here I have a folder. I hope you, you should be able to sort of read that, maybe. 
Yeah? If you have a folder, there's a LAX file, compressed, and a LAX file, very small. It's less than a, a promille. Did you say promille? Like 0.1% of, of the uh, LAX file. And how big is a LAX file? Well, let's, let's do some command line operation. Scary. Oh, oh yeah, that's probably better, right? For, uh... So, if I would run this, last zip, minus input spatial, this file, what it would do, it would unzip it. But I don't really want to do this. It's a fairly big file. All I want to do, I want to see how big it would be if I did that. Um, so it'll tell me it's about 3.7 or 3.6 gigabytes. I don't think I could actually uncompress it because I don't have that much disk space left on this very old Dell laptop. Um, so you see, it's a, it's a nice compression rate. Uh, now let's have a <coughs> look at it. Remember there was a LAX file, and these LAX files are used by all last tools when, when they are there. When they're not there, well, they're not used. And in last view, there's something here, when you go here, it's called spatial quadri. And that only makes sense if there's a LAX file. If you turn it on, you see the LAX files sort of contents uh, or what they mean. This is really only for educational purposes here. Uh, there's just a visualization so I can explain to people what LAX means. You can then use Q to pick a cell. And as I pick these cells, it tells you if you ask me to get all the LIDAR points from this cell, I will load from the file the points in blue. Now it will typically load more than just the points in that cell. Because doing it exact would be very, very expensive in terms of writing it down and also would cause many F-seeks through the file and then again it's not efficient. So instead I only group pieces together that don't require a lot of small F-seeks. So for the large blocks I group together. You may have for one cell you may need to go here, here and here. So before I'm actually seeking, I will merge all these cells into one uh, so that many of these overlaps will again, will again sort of disappear. Because many of these overlaps are identical. Uh, yeah, and another reason, um, another way to notice or to use The, the presence of LAX files, when the LAX file is there, the lustles will use them to draw sort of a very quick, very coarse preview where the data actually is in the bounding box. It's not super useful, but it's kind of useful, especially if you have a strip like that. And what is LAX, LAZ really great at? Well, if you want at the very end of this file, you want to you want to get these few points here. Without LAX, you would have to read the whole file, and that's 3.7 gigabytes you would have to uncompress. But because uh, LAX is there, it adds this now minus inside, and then it gives the coordinates of the box. And, and it directly moves to that point in the file and only gives you these points and you're done. So it's, on a file like this, it's like, 
a thousand times faster, or maybe even more. And, and it's not supposed to replace a spatial database necessarily, but you, it's another trade-off, you know, it's like super little effort and gives you quite some functionality. Um, and you don't need to replicate your data. You don't need to load it up into Oracle, Spatial, or PostSQL. That's just one copy and a tiny lax file. That's all there is. And so when you use last tools, the minus inside or minus inside tile or minus inside circle options will make use of LAX files to clip to the areas you've selected and only load those points, not clip to the whole file. All right, so that was uh, that was. Now let's look more, less in the, in the deep details and more in the usage of last tools. So I had a volcanic island somewhere in my pockets. Um, where did I put it? Oh, here it is. Um, this is the island of uh, El Hierro. It's a Canary Island in front of Africa, it's part of Spain. It would be 20 gigabytes of LAS data, but after LASSing, or you know, last sipping, it's only 2 gigabytes. Uh, 
on, on seven cores. <laughs> and if you do that on one machine, now it's really good to use the LAZ format instead of the LAS format. Why? Because unless you have like some super cool file system, you will be reading and writing LAS files all the time. Your CPUs will wait for the data most of the time and not actually be used. If you use LAZ, your computers will be very busy, the fan will go off, you will use a lot of energy, but they will process because they're taking a factor of 10 off the disk I.O. so you're no longer CPU uh, I.O. limited. Instead, the disk you know, manages likely to come sprung along and your CPUs are all busy compressing, <coughs> decompressing and also of course doing the actual work. Okay. Um, now some pretty pictures uh, for a change. Um, <coughs> last year, last schools got me, or this year, this year, got me to travel a little bit. So I got to visit people that use last tools. And uh, one guy I really wanted to visit for quite some time already was uh, Airborne Research Australia. Uh, they do like ultra minimally invasive remote sensing with these gliders that take very little uh, gasoline. I think you run them with regular car fuel. And uh, well, when we, when we uh, operated the thing, it seemed like just the same amount of effort as, you know, starting a motorbike, except that you had to talk to the tower first before take off. But it was very low overhead once once you set up. And they have uh, LiDAR scanners in these, you know, one is in the, I think in this part is the LiDAR scanner and this is the hyperspectral scanner. And um, there you see us outside, um, me getting some <coughs> more instructions. Um, there are no restrooms, uh, <laughs> uh, tells me that right now. Um, and then we are in the air, Adelaide Hills, very pretty. So we are doing a little LiDAR scan. Uh, it was my first uh, hands-on um, airborne LiDAR scanning. It was really exciting to see how people actually do this, because uh, all I had before was these scripts. And, uh, so there's a flight plan. We want to cover this area. So there's actually, I, I never realized to me how much cutoff there is, you know. We really want to have just a square, but, you know, because the plane doesn't quite turn uh, that tightly, we have to fly all these big circles around it um, to fly along these tracks. That was, that's actually the house uh, from Europe who runs the uh, Airborne Research Australia. Um, and we'll see that later. Uh, so once we came back, we did some quick quality check. You can do that with last boundary. Last boundary minus input, that's in blue. Um, the files that he gave to me, the scripts. Output is KML, and you can give it an output directory, and it generates the KML files. And if they are georeferenced, yeah, you have you can just drag them into Google Earth and you can make sure. Oh yeah, exactly. That's where we flew and that's where the house was. Uh, okay, that looks looks about right. You can do the same with last to dim. Let's generate hell shades for all these scripts individually. Um, you see what I'm doing here. I use the last only. I thin it with the grid. These are also options you can do. <coughs> Blue is input, red is output, black is options. Um, uh, and then you get these strips. You can just quickly see if they're more or less aligned with, uh, with what you've flown and if you've got what you expected. That's sort of part of the initial quality checking. Um, a bit more rigorous quality checking is the last overlap. Again, you give it all the strips and you say the maximum Difference is 2.5 meters vertically, flights up five or five lines. What? And then it computes two rasters. 
This is the first one. This is just an overlap rasher, and it shows you where the overlap is between the flight lines. Color coded from blue is one overlap, cyan is two overlaps. Okay, that's just one flight line. One overlap, two overlaps, three overlaps, and then red is four overlaps. So there will be five flight lines. And you can see, you know, we were kind of sloppy. It was just a fun little uh, acquisition, not nothing serious. Um, but you see, we messed up at this point, where blue turns into white. Uh, we didn't have enough coverage at this point. There are also some other white areas, like this one here. But when orange turns into white, then obviously there was a lot of overlap, but there was a lake, so we didn't get any returns um, or points. If you get lighter from your vendor, and it looks like this, you should just, you know, put a return to sender sticker on it <laughs> and not, you know, and, and demand your money back. So this now shows you the maximum difference in, in vertical between the different flight lines wherever they are overlapping. So, you know, there was an overlap here. So blue means, what is blue and what is red is kind of arbitrary, depends on which strip was first uh, in the list. Uh, but it, very dark red man, that's a 2.5 meters, that means he maxed out the 2.5 meters. Very blue means minus 2.5 meters. What you want to have is mostly white. Very quick way to check your, uh, um, your delivery and it's very fast, works for very large collects um, out of four. Yeah. Oh, by the way, that's... Uh, Jörg can do better than that. Um, we did that on purpose uh, because maybe one day I want to have a tool that fixes such kind of an error by realigning the strips. That's not an easy problem. Uh, I mean, Terra Match, I think, is the uh, only solution uh, in town. Uh, where actually, Opals from Team Vienna is also uh, a very good solution. But it's a hard problem, and you know, I'm just the one. One guy to not do everything. Um, <coughs> and here you can compute a density raster. Uh, there was a question uh, about density grids. Uh, if you want to have the density range from blue is you know zero density to 100 is 100 points per square meter, then you would use this command line here. And it merges on the fly. Let's see, minus merge, it merges all the flies. So on the fly, it gives you that. Last ground gets you the ground points. You, you strip out the vegetation and the houses and a few other things. You see the difference. And then uh, there are some more interpretative tools which work sometimes good, sometimes not so good, depending on the density of your data and your amount of patience of adjusting the parameters. Uh, so this is the house that was at the center of the acquisition. We had insane uh, point density of... Uh, actually, this is just one strip, so it was, was whatever, uh, 20 points per square meter. Um, you get very nice results. What it basically does, last classified tries to find planes, planar planes, because those are likely to be roofs. Uh, it tries to find planes that are above two meters in height. That's why you have to run bus height first. Uh, it does a fairly good job. People tell me they're happy with it, and this tells me probably that my competitors, you know, aren't that smart either. Uh, uh, because it's a hard problem. It's trees look like buildings. Rocks look like buildings. A building look like. I mean, with the, the green roof initiative is terrible for lighter people. I mean, the roof's gonna look like forest. I mean, how are you gonna find those houses? Um, I also got to go to Canary Islands. I mentioned that before. We created uh, this uh, dense, this height map for the east, for the northern slope of the Tate volcano. They use the volcano on the highest point of uh, Spain. 3,500 meters, kind of impressive, because it comes out of the ocean and goes straight up. It's kind of windy up there. Um, 
So we got, this is the island, the ABC volcano. We, we got the data from the local authorities for this area to do a fire model for the forest. And I traded uh, basically you know, two flight tickets, uh, 50 cups of coffee in a bit of pocket space for a last two license. Uh, I don't know, things like that. <laughs> if you live in a nice spot, you know. <laughs> I mean, spring, the island of uh, everlasting spring, or whatever they call it. So we created this map that was rather quick because it's Kelly's uh, standard product with LAS tools. Uh, it's a height map, you know, red is 40 meters, blue is zero meters of the canopy. You know, you nicely see the electric uh, um, power line running across the island where they cut down the forest. Um, you can see some whatever forest management here. I don't know what. I'm, I'm not a forester yet. Um, <laughs> here you see uh, the reason that the professor wasn't happy with our results. Uh, he said, um, "So that's you know <coughs> values of high al no high altitudes in the map." And he said, "40 meters is not an acceptable value for a canopy height." in Tenerife. Well, he, I think he was, because he said, if we publish this and his colleagues will look at this and wow, you think there are 40 meter trees in, in, um, in Tenerife, um, they would, yeah, they would find that wrong and funny and he didn't want to be part of that. So, but I said, it's correct. I can see the points in the point cloud. We used fusion to verify it. There was points that were 40 meters high. So well, well, it wasn't birds, obviously, unless there was a gigantic flock of birds there. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we went out to look at this. Um, there's Alejandro, with whom I was doing the work. Um, you do end up often in the wrong, uh, in the, in the wrong gorge when you're on a, on a volcanic island. So we just said, oh, I think we totally, you know, walked half an hour. It's sort of like dense vegetation, and it was sweaty, and I was stung, I was bleeding. And but nothing because we're on the wrong side. Okay, so we went back down, got a little tired, took the car, and eventually we found the right spot, which was very accessible. We didn't have to do uh, this expedition. And um, that's the solution uh, to the 40 meter trees. Uh, it's a 25 meter tree standing on 20 meter, uh, a steep, uh, you know, almost 80 degree. Um, slopes. So if you have a tiny branch overhanging, this branch is 45, 50 meters above the ground. And just to make it a bit more visual, you have a tree, it's 40 meters. I can grow that tree by not doing anything to the tree, but just changing the terrain where the tree stands on. Uh, I was hoping at Sylvie Laser they would tell me, oh, just use the technique of, you know, blah, 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 and blah, 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 from 2000, blah, 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 but they didn't, so maybe there's some uh, work to be done. Uh, some other things uh, that are nicely, with, uh, in terms of quality checking, there was these missing pieces, it was immediately blamed on me. Uh, another missing piece, you know, oh, look, my body software did, but the density rasters are really useful. So we just got X, Y, Z intensity was, you know, uh, that's what they usually start out with. Um, in a last file, there was no flight line information, no timing, nothing. So we couldn't reconstruct what was going on. But you can create a density raster where you know you go from zero points per square meter to four points per square meter of the entire project and suddenly you see the flight lines because wherever they overlap you have higher density and when you see the flight lines you also see where they messed up you know it wasn't me it was in the flight lines pretty obviously they stopped the scanner too early or didn't budget enough overlap and that happened quite frequently so okay i talked about the tools a little bit already so when you get data what last source you want to run first? I usually use last info 
And when people send me bug reports, like last tool doesn't work, usually I tell the bank, why don't you send me a last info report? And I already see a like, warning, 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 or you know, the bounding box is there and the LIDAR is here, or it's corrupted, or something I don't think about right now. Um, last info and last view are your friends to understand your, data, your new data quickly. Last boundary, you know, it's some people like it a lot um, to, with this option here, minus holes, uh, it finds holes in the data and then it draws basically a super lightweight representation of that. And if you output it as KML files or shape files, you can quickly sort of look at what your scripts look like without looking at the gigantic LIDAR files themselves. And again, these run in batch mode, you know, minus cores seven at the end, and uh, your coffee break doesn't need to be that long. Uh, last grid, you create the density rasters, or you instantly also see where is data missing, and so on. By adding this, and having like a false colored PNG, Output. I mean, assuming they have the correct uh, data with the correct um, um, space reference of UTM-28, we will automatically create the KML files alongside the images. So when you double click, it will position it in Google Earth at the right spot. Um, I don't have ArcGIS. Um, maybe you have all maybe ArcGIS, so you will be looking for, to use TIFF instead, where the spatial indexing is embedded somewhere. So that never works for me. I, like whenever I open something in ArcGIS, it always tells me it's an error message, and I need to click somewhere saying use this reference. Maybe I'm not really it right. But a good tool also is last duplicate. If you suspect you have way too many points, what happens sometimes if a vendor sends you data, they by accident process it in a way that the data is twice in one file. And it's not so hard to, uh, not so easy to notice because if you look at it, it looks just about right because there's one point on top of every other point and you can't see it. So if you, uh, but you would double your point identity. So if you like last info would tell you last info minus CD by the way, compute density also reports uh, point identity. Um, oh, it's right there. <clears throat> you you get double the point density. That, that would of course not be correct. So last duplicate, when it reports two million duplicate points in a four million file, it's likely every point is in that place. Um, and then last overlap, I've showed you before. Those are the quality checking tools that, that if you're not sure about your LIDAR, you know, before you send me an error message, you know, go through these and see if your data is maybe totally messed up.